the excellence of John Collins' ability and his career was perfectly emblemised by his pretty dramatic move from Celtic to Monaco in 1996, where he'd play alongside a couple of relatively promising youngsters named Thierry Henry and David Trezeguet, whatever happened to them. I went down to Monte Carlo and La Tourbie, the training ground, to interview John 20 years ago and saw what I thought were many remarkable things of the Monaco sporting culture. In this big interview, John explains, for example, why it was that those two young French internationalists were asked to carry the kit hamper into the dressing room at most away games during that season, just before they won the World Cup so dramatically with their country. During his own time in French football, John underwent something of a technical and tactical revolution and found that that was well within his capability, well within his locker. But his marginal gains approach to self-improvement had started way back in his teens, and he explains it. How else would a skinny kid from Gala Shields get the opportunity to line up alongside George Best in only his second professional game? He tells a wonderful story about how he simply couldn't believe that was going to happen. John still has strong opinions with which I fully agree about the development of young footballers. Here we talk about Jean Tigana, rugby, John Stones, sweeper keepers and their use, their meaning in the modern game. Plus, of course, that iconic cheeky wink to camera before Scotland-Brazil, the opening game of the 1998 World Cup in France. Did you think it was to you? He'll tell you why it wasn't. This is a player who was ahead of his time in many ways um, during his own career and sadly because the game has slipped backwards I think he's still very far ahead of the thinking of most people in modern football, certainly in modern football development. He shouldn't be out of the game. His views should be listened to and applied and if anybody's got any sense they'll employ him very soon. How much I enjoyed talking to John Collins for the big interview. John, I think it's well established that beyond a super athlete and a good footballer, you're a generous man. And the proof of that is this is the 20th anniversary of the first time you tolerated an interview by me, which was in different, less beautiful surroundings, warmer surroundings. Take us back, if you will, to La Tourbie, which is where I think I met you for the first time. And it's a place that impressed me a lot. So before we tell the bigger story of John Collins, the Monaco player, La Tourbie, describe where we met and what that meant to you in your working life. Well, La Tourbie is uh, Monaco's training base. Um, up in the mountains behind Monaco, actually in France. It's cut out of a mountain. Beautiful views, backdrop of the Mediterranean. The most beautiful drive up to a training ground probably in the world. In the world yeah. um, I came from Barrowfield and any Scottish person will tell you Barrowfield's not the prettiest drive in the world from Celtic <laughs> Park to Barrowfield, but it was a wonderful training complex um, and for me it was a night and day moving from Scotland to Monaco uh, so it was a great location but more important than anything what goes on on top of those pitches um, is the most important the work that gets done in the training pitch Can I take you to something that I saw like, and I am obsessed by little details but we were obviously we were a bit nervous or at least wanting to put on our best show chatting to you and not make a, a pig's breakfast of it and we're watching, we're allowed to watch training, that's the first thing, as a journalist you go, this is inner sanctum, because in Britain we believe that journalists should be brilliant at writing about football without ever seeing how it happens, yeah. which is just daft. So we get to watch training, and it's stunning. But at the end, I don't know why we were taking it into the dressing rooms, maybe just to register with you, where every single player, none of whom knew us, stopped as they're changing or showering or whatever. But as we walked past, every single player, bonjour, say good morning, handshake to these strange foreigners, show of respect. I, I'd never seen anything. That's part of that club's culture at the time, or? Well, exactly the same thought that I had the first day I walked in. Everybody coming up to me, shaking a hand, bonjour, welcome. And it's something that happens every single day. You go down to the academy in the stadium, you've got all the academy kids, nobody knows, knows me. Every single one of them walks up, first thing they do is say bonjour. And I think it's... It was something that really surprised me when I came back and I came back to Everton and it wasn't part of the, the daily routine. Some players would just take their coats off, hang up, hardly say a word. Um, but I really appreciated it. It made you feel welcome and part of them. And, and it wasn't just uh, shaking a hand for the sake of it. They look you in the eye and, and it comes with a smile. So 
Was it part of Monaco's culture or a French culture? I don't know, but certainly at the football club, it was something that, to this day, I was there three weeks ago watching the training, I was over with the family, and it the same thing. Players come up, say bonjour, welcome. What was the um, motivation? Let's leave all talk about contracts or Bosman's aside. When you've got that option to go to Monaco, and, and my memory is at the time that you have plenty of options, Nice not being one of them. Um, what, what's the motivation to say, I'll choose this? Well, I was come at the end of my contract at Celtic. I signed two three-year deals. I've seen the first one out, signed a new three-year deal. And in the final year of my contract, I'd made the decision that it was time for a new challenge. I was 28 years of age, and I've been in Scotland playing first-team football since I was 17. Um, and I was going to make a move. So when my agent phoned me and says, Monica want to fly over and talk, I thought, wow, that sounds exciting. One, French football was a good standard. True. Technical. Um, ball played on the grass, which is the way I like to play it. Um, Monaco, obviously a beautiful place and a beautiful climate. It appealed to me. Uh, I've got to be honest, I didn't know too much about Monaco and the players. Actually, I, I didn't know any of them. Mm. So, but I, I knew they were always pushing for the league, top three, four clubs in France. Um, and when I went over to talk to them, I liked what I had. Mr Tagana had to say to me, the first thing I asked the coach, the most important thing at that stage of my career, I wanted to play central midfield. I didn't want to play wide. Um, so before we talked money or contracts or mm. anything, the contact, the talk with John Tigana was, where are you going to play me in the team? He pulled out his matchbox, pulled out 10 matches, put his shape of his team up and says, that's where you're going to be playing in that central zone. Well, this young, quick player on the wing, outside you who'll suit you, play passes, and that young player turned out to be a great young player, went on to have an amazing career, which was Thierry only. So the first thing was, I wanted to go there, but I wanted to play in a position which I felt um, I enjoyed most, and that was central midfield. So. That was a demand to have more influence in the play, was it? Yeah, to be, when you play central midfield, you can control the game, you can get it off the back four, and then you feed. When you play wider, you've got to wait on players feeding you, so there can be large periods of the game, long periods of the game when you don't get a touch of the ball, but you're still making the runs and working hard. And it's, it's an important role in the team, the wide player, don't get me wrong, it's vital. Um, but I just felt at that stage of my career, I wanted to play that central role so I could be involved in the match in the thick of the action. One of the things we've learned with the feedback to this is that, sadly, not everybody's of my generation, and you're younger than me, but you'd have been of an age to understand who Takana was when you were talking to him. For those who haven't maybe seen him play, he, he genuinely, not only was he a great, he was part of one of the great European midfields in that um, France side that wins the European Championship. And they were genuinely sensational, weren't they? Yeah, it was um, Platini, Gires, I mean, top quality. Um, and they're sort of the idols at the time, they were French idols. When I went across, wherever we went, away from home, it wasn't the players that the supporters were talking or looking for autographs, it was still Jean Tigana. So he was a great player, he played in the midfield zone, so I certainly had a, a relation with him um, when it came to talking tactics and what he wanted from me. Was he a teacher? He wasn't a great, it wasn't a, how can I put it politely, he knew f what he wanted from his players. He told me he wanted everybody to pass and move and receive the ball and work hard, but he wasn't a coach that worked hours on end on tactics and moving the team about. Um, but I think his biggest asset was selecting players, not that he signed me, but he signed good players and he liked giving young players a chance, um, which I think was a, a big thing for him, certainly at Monaco, because um, we had obviously a budget to buy players mm. and they, all, they often did buy players. But when I was there the first year, he integrated two young players into the first team, Trezeguet and Henri, um, which takes a bit of doing for a young a manager to do. But, needless to say, those young players did a great job for the team and him. But he was a quiet manager, wasn't a manager that was shouting and bawling and too animated on the pitch. But he gave very simple messages, what it is to play, go and play. Um, and he had a good group of players with. It was, it was a sensational group, and I remember going in this interview that you gave me, remember that at the time, like Kenny Douglas at Newcastle going very well. And you'd drawn them, it was the break in the European trophy, which was the UEFA Cup, and you knew that in March it was Newcastle. And then in England, because there are a lot of people who maybe don't have a wide vision, well, that's an easy draw. Newcastle through. I remember you saying to me, See that kid over there with a the long sort of Rastafarian hair? 
he'll take Newcastle apart. He'll absolutely. People haven't heard about Thierry Henry, but he's. You said. I mean, I think at the time he was 19, yeah. and he'd only had, you know, about 15, 20 starts, tops. And uh, you marked my card and said, this guy's just going to be exceptional. Yeah, he had lightning pace. He was so athletic. Um, never had a great left foot. Something he had to work on. Mm. And, and he did. He worked every, and he's finishing every day after training. But our forward line was, was terrific. In front of me, we had a little number 10 called Ali Bernarbia. Fantastic Sensational player. Sensational football. Sensational Did he come 10. to City in the end? He came to City, yeah, yeah. at the end yeah. of his career. Yeah. Played for Paris and Bordeaux after Monaco as well. And we had a striker the first season, Sonny Anderson, yeah. who was a terrific Brazilian. We sold him for fortunes to Barcelona. Uh, it didn't do so well at Barcelona, I don't know why, but he came back to Lyon and won title after title in the, in the terrific Lyon team. But he had blistering pace and skill as well. So we, Little Victor? Victor on the, on the right hand side, Ekpeba, the Nigerian winger. Um, so we had lots of talent. When Thierry Henry comes into the team, is he playing wide or yeah, off the strip? No, I played wide. He played outside left. Uh -huh. played out wide of me. Which Coming, cutting in on Cutting his... in at his right foot and yeah. bending things in the, in the top corner or the far away post. Um, but his biggest asset as a young player was he's, he's just, one, he was powerful, two, blistering pace. And he was raw. Uh, sometimes he held onto the ball too much. But if, if pace just frightened to death to, to defenders um, and he was very humble well mannered and a hard worker came through the academy system Clairefontaine well educated uh, worked hard didn't have a too big an ego he was calm uh, always listening to the senior players I've got a wonderful story I tell you the year we won the title the rules we had an old kit man he was a 7 year old Pity Louis he was called too old to be a kit man and mm. carrying hampers, but he folded the, the jerseys. Mm. And the rules were, the youngest in the squad carried the hampers off every bus, every plane, wherever we went. And the season they went on to become World Cup winners with France, they carried the hampers on and off the bus without one moan. Um, and Is I always... Is again on me? Yeah. And I, I, when I think back, I think, well, credit to them, but it was, it was the rules in the club. Young boys do the lifting and the carrying and keeps her feet on the ground and remember where they came from. This is something that we, we talk about a lot because you know, I've lived in Spain for 15 years now but we've talked to, we've talked to Chrissy Ward a little bit. <sighs> training ground culture in Britain and, and Martin on the train here was talking about in the, the majority of the big continental countries the way in which it's expected that players maybe have breakfast at training, maybe stay for lunch, that their diets are controlled but that they either do a little bit of extra work or maybe some gym work, but it's not, which I think the predominant British culture has been in getting about 15 minutes for training, get stripped, do, do an hour and a half, get out of there. In the bad old days, maybe to the bookies of the snooker hall or for, for a bevy. But also this concept over my lifespan has been, if you're a footballer, you, get in, you do your training, it's important, and then the rest of the day is yours. Whereas I don't think that in the leading continent, that, that wouldn't have been your experience. No, at not at all. I think um, the first thing, I, the biggest difference when I went to Monaco was um, Celtic was hard training, pre-season was tough. My first week we went to a training camp up in the mountains and I'll never forget it. Um, I, straight, I was sharing with a, a, young, a young player. Um, he came into the room, we had dinner, arrived at about 7 o'clock, went down for dinner, came up to the room. About 9 o'clock he went out of the room and came back up with his training kit. And I was like, well, what have you got your training kit for? And he says, oh, you have to go and get it tonight, because we start 7.30 in the morning. We go Before breakfast we go for a, a jog in the woods, that's the first <coughs> session. And I thought he was joking, I thought, mm -hmm. seriously, <laughs> 7.30, start yeah, up right. at 7 o'clock. Shine on. So sure enough, it was true, I had to go down and get my kit. First morning, 7.30 session up to your room, shower, breakfast, back, 10.30 start, technical session with the ball working hard till midday, lunch, into your room, siesta, back out for a third session, technical again, five o'clock, and for a 10 day training camp, it was training three sessions one day, two sessions the next, three, two, three, two, and in between that, eating well, sleeping well, so after 10 days, it was like, wow, it was the equivalent of what I would normally get as three weeks training back home because the players come train in the morning, go home. So the amount of work we got done in that training camp was mm. incredible. And also at the same time, for me being a new player, it was wonderful. I spent a lot of time with my new teammates, getting to know mm -hmm. them. They were getting to know me and I, obviously I was working on my French at that time. But 
it's the same in academies over there. They put a lot of hours on the training pitch. It's not just one session a day, I think. I may be wrong, but most Scottish teams will play on Saturday. They'll have Sunday off. They'll train Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. They'll have Wednesday off. Mm -hmm. They'll train Thursday morning, a little bit on Friday. So for me, the younger players that from the age of 18 to 21 are still developing their mm -hmm. game and their technique. They need more sessions, more afternoon sessions to work on their technique. Um, but there's certainly improvements in, in the way Scotland and Scottish teams are, are training in the hours, but I think there's still a long way from the It's French. a philosophical change that's needed, isn't it? I think it's just we have to approach it different mentally. Well, it's a job. Uh, it's a full-time job. It's not like you just don't go in and do like, an hour and a half session and think, I've done my work, that's me finished. You've got to ask, your, ask yourself, what else do I need to do? What, what other work could I do? And it doesn't have to be physical. It might mean I'm going out in the afternoon, I'm going to just work on my right foot, mm -hmm. doing passing just pinging it 20, 30 yards from my left footer. Um, I see a lot of players that are so one-footed. Mm. Um, and one thing that when I'm watching, when I'm watching Scottish football, I hear, I see, uh, oh, he's a left-sided centre-half, he's mm. 20, he's poor his right foot. I'm like, well, how long has he been at the club? Oh, since he was 10. And I'm like, well, how can he have a, how can he have a poor right foot if he's been in, this, in the club system since he was 10 years of age? For me, when that happens, it means there's a flaw in the system. Mm. If you've got to have, if you've got a player in your system for ten years, you can't be twenty years of age and be have a poor right foot. You've got to work right foot, left foot, and I think maybe that's what the continental clubs they break it down in France, and they do more individual work on the players, and I think that's we can learn more from that and spend more time on the training pitch. Take aside the, your talent um, and set it just to, to one side for a minute. I'd imagine the more demanding that the atmosphere was on a daily basis in France, probably the more that helped you. I mean, you're somebody who, I mean, grit and determination and self-betterment are just pretty much embedded in your well, character. Well, training is always something. I've always loved training. I've always loved pushing myself. Um, from a very young age, it was encouraged from my, my, my father. I had a big brother, huge role played in my development as a football player. Why? Because I played with my big brother's friends all through my childhood, from seven years of age up until about 14. I was playing with big guys. I was never the star in the training pitch or in the streets because they were all bigger and stronger than me. So I've always been pushed, pushed, pushed. And, and when I went to Monaco again, I was pushed to another level mm. um, on the training pitch. Mm. So with the big brother, that's pushed to, you, you want to, you're not left behind, you want to be knocked over, you want to show on one of the big boys. Well, it, one thing, competitive? You, well, it's competitive, but when you play with bigger kids, um, you can't run past them because you're no faster than them. You can't bump your way around them because you're no stronger than them. Mm. So you have to think and use your skill and develop your football brain. So I have to one-two it past them. I have to play it right and run past them on the left. Or I have to go forward and then jink backwards, change direction, use my strengths, which is I'm smaller, I'm more nimble. So people talk about street football, small-sided games. That's where you develop your brain and your touch because you're getting thousands of touches and you're making thousands of decisions under pressure, often against bigger players. And it's something that's gone now. Street football won't come back in, the, in as it was in the past. No. But I've said it before, many people have heard me, we've got to try and replicate that in the academies. Mm. And that doesn't mean, and that means moving players up levels, age levels. So testing them, taking them test, out of their comfort zone. Taking them out of their comfort zone, so they're not a, a, a big number nine, under 13, scoring mm. 50 <laughs> goals because he's bigger, stronger. Yeah. Because you're, he's not developing. Yeah. And I also say, as soon as you go three goals up, and as a youth player, you're not developing as a player. Because mm. it's too easy, the opposition is, there's too much space and it's too easy. So you, you've got to try and develop your academy teams, that they're all playing up. So if you, for example, you're Celtic or Rangers, you don't want to be winning 5 nil, 3 nil, 6 nil. So can you have the under 12s, a lot of the good ones, playing up an age? And for me, that's what street football did to mm. the good football players. They were stretched, mm. playing against bigger, stronger, thinking, you, making their brain work on that training pitch and getting thousands of touches of the ball. Um, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think when I break it down, that's what we've got to try and get back to within our academies. Now, I was up in Aberdeen uh, recently and I was really, really proud that the Dennis Law Legacy Trust has persuaded uh, the Cruyff Foundation to have Scotland's first Cruyff Court in Aberdeen. Mm. They did that by reminding Cruyff and the, the people that worked for him that the only Scottish Ballon d'Or winner came from Aberdeen. So 
what we get is this court where these things are going to be available to kids who don't have facilities. It's free, it's open, it's, there are 200 all over the world. And it, reading back on what Johan used to say, it's just amazing. You've, you've replicated everything that Cruyff said about life. I was playing the cobblestones in Amsterdam, and there was a car parked there, there was a curb. I was like, right, can I use the curb for a one, two? And in a Cruyff, the last interview I did with Cruyff, which was last year, about a year ago now, and um, Thomas Tuchel, the Dortmund manager, stood up and said, I'm Dortmund manager because I, I was successful at youth level and I got through the ranks and I got picked up and I was a Harrod and I fought for the youngsters and they must have the best of everything, the best travel, the best kit, they must be treated like... He said, now we've bred people who don't have solutions, who are automatons and maybe are quite well put together but only if things are linear, he said. I'd go back now and I'd change everything. I'd make the coach slow, the bus slow. I'd break the from air conditioning in there. I'd make them wash their own strips. And is it, has he got a point that because street football will never come back in the way we've been talking about, we have to find ways to make these players think about how to resolve problems, how to use things as assets that seem to be barriers? Yeah, I think it, use time. Um, I think sometimes I think players and, and sometimes coaches, sports science have, have got a lot to do with it. They sometimes say, oh, you're training too much and rest. And I think a lot of the time, I, I agree with sports science a lot of the time, but when it comes to young boys, um, I think they should be spending more time with the ball in the afternoons. Mm. They've trained in the morning, they've had their lunch, have a nice rest, back if it's if it's if we've got an indoor gym or go and play 3v3s, go and get set up little small areas, 4v4s, and people talk about, I go and see big games, 11v11 kids, 12, 13 year olds, some kids hardly getting a kick. What you get in 4v4s is triangles everywhere. Mm. You get decisions made constantly, defensive decisions. Where do you go? Moving right, moving left, moving forward, moving backwards, and when you have the ball at your feet, exactly the same. I'm looking right, I'm looking left, and people are coming towards you. Football, some people say it's a simple game, but it's a game that's learned. People are coming towards you all the time. People are going away from you at different times. There's a ball involved, so the brain's working A lot constantly. of decisions to make. A lot of decisions, a lot of distances to be read. And the more they have of small, high-tempo games at a young age, the more their brain and their touch is developing. And that's where we've fallen behind European countries in Scotland. Because, technically, we're not where we should be mm. and tactically we've because we're not technically mm. where we should be our tactics have evolved to such an extent we're not playing technical skillful gifted football from the back through the goalkeeper because people are saying oh they're getting caught in the ball because they've no technique so let's just kick up the park so basically when you say that you're giving up you're saying mm. well we're not playing football anymore we're Correct. playing a different sport we're playing a game that's half rugby half football mm. um, so it's got to be a radical change. And people say, oh, um, players don't grow on trees. Players are developed. Mm. Developed by a system mm. and by coaches doing the right things on a daily basis. <coughs> and the reason we're not developing and getting to World Cups and European Champions is it's, it's no bad luck. It's nothing to do with luck. <laughs> it's all to do with the system's broken and has to be fixed. And people say, what? It's a bit harsh for me to say that, but it's, trust me, people are scared to say it. Please God, there are more people. So please God, there are people listening to you now and more people saying and, the same things. I love football and I love, I, I love seeing young players doing the right things on a training pitch. And when I'll go and watch youth games and I see the keeper kicking up the, ball, up the pitch, flicking it on, somebody flicking it on, scoring a goal and everybody cheering, thinking, yes, I'm thinking, that's nothing to cheer about. Hmm. Eight players haven't touched the ball. Mm. Eight players haven't been involved in that move. Eight players haven't developed in their skills. And, and I, I sound like a broken le record when I watch Barcelona, Pep's team. Mm. It's total football. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes in after the last five, six years, ten years we've watched Barcelona. Did you see Barcelona last night? Ah, it was brilliant. And I'm like, right, so let's copy it. Yeah. Let's copy it in every training pitch, every field. Let's try and do what they do. Ah, but they were good players. Uh, like we've got to develop football players and that's the way to development it starts at the goalkeeper mm. and the big debate in England just now is Pep changing the goalkeeper and a lot of people in England just don't get it no. they're just not getting it Pep doesn't want a goalkeeper he wants a goalkeeper and an outfield player 
that's where it all starts. He's behind those back four. He's making angles, constantly moving. So they've got another outfield player. Yeah. Once he gets it right, and it'll take time, it's going to blow them all away. Mm. Because so many in, uh, players, pundits, journalists, they aren't getting it in it's England. Appalling. They are not getting it. They it's, don't understand, it's do they? unbelievable. They don't realise. And there's two things. A goalkeeper being good technically, that means mm. he can ping a nice ball, good at passing, mm. but he's been able to do that under pressure. And for Pep's goalkeepers is sucking a centre forward as close to him as possible, taking him out of the zone where he wants to go in, and he passes it right, and then it goes in that zone where the centre forwards come out. So you've got one fewer player that's pressing, the lines have begun to be broken, everybody else around that's been in a perfect formation has got to make decisions. And I hear it week in, week in, the Sky Sports. What's difficult? I hear it saying, oh, he's taking a risk. What is he doing playing there? They don't get it. They don't get it, what Pep's trying to create with Man City. That's where his success started in Barcelona. Mm. It start, everything starts with the goalkeeper. Mm. Um, well, let me ask you then in that case, because as well as... Like, I, I can speak this way because it's our podcast. As well as your brilliant eye and the ability to articulate it, which too few people in football can do, you played with one of those. You played with Van der Sar, who's of that model. Yes. And archetypical of that model. And I think a brilliant footballer. And that's why he came through the, the Ajax Academy, educated by the Johan Cruyff. Mm. Um, he's a footballer. Van der Sar, I remember it. Get a phone call from Manchester United when Van, Van de Sar was at Fulham with me. Hey, what do you think of Man, Van de Sar? Is he good to play at Man United? I went like, he is made for a big club. How lucky we've been having him at Fulham. He's a great shot stopper. He's a fantastic with his feet. He's a talker, a leader. Perfect. It's but a lot, again, it? it's, it's, you're not getting one player in that position. You're not getting a goalkeeper. You're getting a goalkeeper. You're getting a centre half. You're getting a sweeper in the one position. And that's why. Again, Spain had it. Mm. Uh, Germans have got it now with Neuer. Mm. They're another level up, so they're a player ahead. Yeah. They're English. Simple arithmetic, isn't it? Um, and people You've got one say, more people, I hear people saying, I hear, I hear pundits and people on television saying, oh, his job is just to catch the ball and save. I just want my goalkeeper to make saves. You're like, well, hold on. He'll touch it eight times with his feet to two with his hands, maybe even more. So what do you think he should be working on? His hands or his feet? 80% to 20%. No, he'll make one save in a game, but he'll start 50 moves. He'll start 50 moves. That's I, I think as well, if you... Uh, listen, this is just a proposition to you. If your keeper is all these things you're describing, then let's say it's not the time when he's going to play and draw people and put it across the box, which we were always told yeah. never, ever do. Let's say it's just you've made him since the age of 10 until he's now 25 and in the <laughs> Manchester United first team or the Manchester City first team. You've made him think like a footballer. It's not just, right, my job's done, oh, I've caught this. Right, who wants it? It's like, in the inst look at Neuer's. I think, was it, was it the David Moyes United team when United score away there? And it, there's a brilliant little, do they call it a vine on the internet, where United players are running away in celebration, and it looks like Neuer's running with him to celebrate it. But he's not, he's running to get the ball immediately, because he's like, we'll restart, we'll get going, and, you know, as soon as the kickoff goes, by a minute score again. But the keeper, with the ball in hand, who's thinking like a footballer, will be distributing it in a way that will catch the other team out during the oh. course of a season. You'll, you'll get assists from goalkeepers. Well, if, if, it'd be interesting to find out how many Barcelona goals over the years and Bayern Munich have started with a goalkeeper. Oh, People right. talk, but sometimes they get caught in the ball and they can see the goal and they go, oh, disaster, they've conceded a goal because they've been caught in the back. Count, somebody should do some <laughs> research. How many goals have been started with Neuer? A pass back or a, a pass out or a throw in with his hands, it'll be. It's a, a net game. It's me. a net game. It's a big, big game. But we've got to change this mindset in Britain, not Scotland. This is a British thing. Yes. That the goalkeeper has now got to be an outfield player. Let's take as well a debate that I don't know if you're tearing your hair out about, but without blowing John Stones up yet to be the finished article. But you can see that there's elegance and there's ability, that he's very confident in the ball and that he can become a footballer that can pass it and can break lines. If you're in a team where you want the sweeper to break that first line and then make a big pass, a good mm. pass, he's going to get there, you'd think. But there seems to be exactly the same negativity or, or fear about seeing a footballer at the back. And they're almost, almost as if people are gleeful, ex-players too, are gleefully on him all the time, on his back 
all the time. And I, I haven't it's understood. I'd like to see more positive, well, optimistic reception. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very British thing. Um, I've seen the exact same thing as you. They're like, oh, Stones is taking risks. Um, and it's a word we use in Britain, but we, we don't use it so much in France. And I know they don't use it in Spain no. or Barcelona. Risk, that's not a risk. That's called taking responsibility mm. to use the ball mm. and not to be scared when an opponent gets close to you. And every now and again you get caught and you can see the goal, but big deal if you're making, if you're starting or creating 20 goals, will you make passing that ball to fullback, fullback goes to the winger, the winger make, does his magic and it's a goal. But it all starts with goalkeeper centre half. So John Stones needs, he needs to do things quicker. I think yeah. he can get the ball and make it quicker, make quicker decisions. That's the next stage of his development. What I like, he wants to take the ball, mm. he wants to take responsibility and he doesn't panic. And I just hope he doesn't panic because he, what the English media are put, trying to transfer into his mind that negativity, get into Rose Ed, clear your lines. I've heard it all before. Mm. A lot of nonsense. Mm. Might work for average teams and average players, but teams that win the Champions League, Bayern Munich and your Barcelona, it's total football from the back, from the centre halves. And we had one, Rio Ferdinand was total football at Manchester United before, and before he, when he was at West Ham. He was a cultured, relaxed football. Was Virgil van Dijk got another one. Total football player, carries the ball like a midfielder. He's calm, he's no happy just kicking it into Rose Ed. I can I hear it all clear. I hear it again in the media. Get into Rose Ed, clear your lines. I'm like, that's not developing football players. You never hear that in France or in Spain. Never mind all the pressure and money. Football is entertainment. And the people you've talked about there are the guys you'd pay the daft ticket prices to go and watch. Well, and I, and I think um, that's what the fans deserve. Um, yeah. And I think for English football to go again, start winning Champions League, mm. they've got to get better at that. Mm. Um, and I want to see a centre half going out the full back area, looking to fake it up, the, play it up the line, pull mm. it inside with a Cruyff turn, play it in the central mid. For me, that's top quality defender. Yeah. A defender who wins it, keeps it. No wins it and kicks up the part and gives it back to the opposition, clears the line. The it's real like quality is winning it, keeping it. Who could do that? Well, Beckenbauer could do it. Did he have a career? Was he quite famous? Who could do that? Oh, Samer could do that. Was he, did he have a bit of a career? Oh, Timotheus. How, how did he go in his career? Well, when they all did that. Yeah. But yeah, it's like Stones is just risking his... That drives me absolutely bonkers. And he's not there yet. His decision-making and his capacity to learn. He's got to, are... got to do things quicker. He's got to make quicker mm. decisions. Get the ball and quiet it quicker. Yeah. Get it, give it, get it, give it quicker. Yeah. Just now he's a little bit... can be a little bit slow. He's hesitating a little process, bit. Isn't it? But he's learning. It's yeah, again, it's... He's on the right track. I just hope the English media, but he's lucky. He's got the right manager. The right manager that's going to encourage him to he take does, it he all day long. He's, a he's won the lottery player. there. Let's change the pace a little bit. The, the keeper, we've talked about keepers. I mean, Fabian Barthez was a footballer. He came and, and what was quite a character in, in English football. What was it like playing with, with Barthez at the back? Because I need to point out that your time at Monaco was, was fabulous. Title. Um, Late stage semi final of the UEFA Cup, semi final of the Champions League yep. as well. It was an elite group. Starting at the back, Fabian Barthez. Barthez was a good football player again with his feet. A small goalkeeper, but he had a terrific spring. Mm. He could jump very high and he had great confidence. He was one of those guys that was never stressed, just cool, calm, came to training. He was always in his jeans, torn jeans and a t shirt, dead relaxed. Um, but he was a happy guy on the training pitch, a terrific attitude. Didn't like, like most goalkeepers, didn't like conceding. Mm. But he was a footballing goalkeeper. Again, that's what I liked about him. He passed it, had a terrific left foot, pinged it. And I was no surprise when he got a, a big move to, to Manchester as well. Did he do well at Manchester? I think he did. had a decent career at Manchester. Um, wasn't probably the standard of Edwin van der Zaar, mm. But he was a good goalkeeper. And I go into my right back, Sanyol. Well, he's a tough guy. Good football player, yeah. a great career at Bayern Munich. But again, he was a f technically gifted football player. He was so confident in the ball, liked to get forward. Manu Petit. Just a joy to watch. Um, him. At, at, at my Monaco team, uh, he was often played, sometimes he played centre half, sometimes he played left back, sometimes he played central mid. But he was more often in the back line than, than he was in midfield. But he went on to Arsenal. Nearly to Rangers, Walter Smith yeah. came down to. 
That's right. I think that it. was a year before. Yeah. Before I went, Rangers were, were sniffing and interested in him. A good, good all-round football player. Did the simple things very well. Nice left foot. Won tackles and kept the ball. And he had a terrific career. Um, we, we, we sat with Michael Carrick in this series and we were asking him to describe I don't know why. Because he was talking about liking the battles with Arsenal. And he was talking about pity and he said he had this technique of you'd win it, turn, see a space. He said he'd play a little golf shot with his left foot to set over Mars, backspin on the ball, over whoever's coming out, over Mars, bombing through, just did this lovely distribution. Terrific left foot. It's, it's a good description he did. He, he chipped it with a backspin. He was always comfortable on it. And his left foot, he was all, all left foot. Um, again, fairly quiet lad, just got on with his work. Um, no surprise that he went on, he had a terrific career. He actually went to Barcelona, didn't he? I, for, keep, I forget about that. He did, he did, he did it. I don't know why it didn't quite work. And the series of Arsenal players, maybe until Henri, who'd come and promised the world and didn't click. It's a funny uh, club. It was in transition at the time. Yeah. They didn't have a philosophy. Um, I'm, I think they were buying stars rather than buying bits of a jigsaw, which yeah. didn't help the players. But it was, it was an odd one, and I was so excited when he came, because that 98 World Cup winning team, I thought he was underrated in it. Um, I was a brilliant athlete, and okay, Vieira wasn't in your team, but the two of them together, I think you'd have hated, well, you might have loved, but geez, you, you, what an afternoon you'd have had if you were playing against yeah, Vieira. I played against, I played against that team when I was at, was it Fulham or Everton? I played, and they were, a, it was a terrific Arsenal team, with Petit in it. They, it was a big, powerful team as well as skillful. Um, and kind of after that generation it went to Barcelona kind of took over and it was the smaller players yeah. so you went from the big boys Perez was six foot and skillful mm, Petit, Thierry Henry, Bergkamp so he said a lot of talent over Mars talent. lightning quick that's you had one that, that bridged because was Grimaldi not with you at that's Monaco? right they, both those they, after my first year Grimaldi and Petit both went to Arsenal Sonny Anderson left and went to Barcelona um, so a lot of people were thinking oh, that's the Monaco team broken up uh, they're going to struggle the second year we never won the league the second year but we, we managed to we won the, the league the first year got, which got us into the Champions League and we, we did well in the Champions League semi-final we those, those were epic games do well, you remember that you went to side you played against? yeah it was a, it was a top Juventus Lippe, side. Zidane Davids Deschamps yeah. Didier and a, but was maybe even no, I don't know if it was Peruzzi not Van der Sar yeah. and goals we gave them a run for the money they beat them in Louis Deux, didn't you? When he got beat, I was suspended for the first game. I got booked a couple of times against Manchester United, so I missed the first leg uh, in Turin. And we, we took a, I think it was 4-1, you have to check, 4-3-1. Four four right. but, but at Stade Louis Deux, we got back to with one, within one goal. Yeah. Um, I remember it was pouring rain, the pitch wasn't great, but we gave him a fright. Um, Were you playing opposite? Was that Zidane, Zidane? Zidane was in my zone, so he was a great... What was, was the, what, was the, what was the approach to trying to compete with Zidane. Well, Zidane, you've got to try and get tight to him. Listen, when the ball arrives, you've got to try and arrive when the ball arrives because if, if he gets control of the ball and then turns and faces you, he's got such quick feet and great vision, then you're going to struggle. So my, when I was playing against, kind of kind of arrive at him when the ball arrives. But he was probably the best I played against. Best ever? You've... Yeah. But, was... I mean, you're strong, but when I when I see him now, let's see, go to press conferences, whatever, and it often strikes me about very good players. Because you, you, you see him from a distance, you forget their size and they come up next year. Ronaldinho was the same. Zidane's a, a, a big old athlete, yeah, big old unit. Yeah, he's a good size, Zidane. St had strength? Or? Strength, but his biggest asset was his balance, balance was and his ball control uh, and his vision. And great skill, right foot, left foot. Um, he was just an outstanding football player. Is there ever a time in a, in a football game when you're a lover of football? Is there any other temptation that you're playing with greats? I know your job is to close and get, but can you be drawn into watching the opposition? <coughs> no, I think... Never you, ever? No, you try, you try and avoid that. I think you, when you're playing against great players and great teams, I think the, the last thing you want to do is show them too much respect. Um, you've got to try and think they're not... The mindset's got to be they're not as good as they think they are or people think they are. Um, that was always my take on it when I was playing against top players. Never always worked. You <laughs> often got beat against them, but I think if you give them too much time and, and think they're better than they actually are, they just destroy you. Don't feed the confidence yeah. at any cost. Is um, about 2004, I was down in Monte Carlo um, after 
your old team beat Chelsea, Claudio Ranieri's side. And it was a big night because Chelsea had been leading, it looked perfect, Ranieri changed things, Monaco got late goals, 3-1. They won on the final and that night in, in, in the town, there was this fella up on a table in the bar dancing with two beautiful women. <laughs> Royal fella, the prince, up on a table giving it, oh you beauty, Prince Rainey's son, Grace Kelly's boy. Um, I know you know him very well, I've interviewed him before, sportsman, yeah. Olympic sportsman. Um, his days are gone now, but what was it like with the old, did you get on with the Prince? Yeah, but he was very attached to the football team. And people often surprised when I say this, he used to regularly come down to the dress room before the game and after the game, wishing us all the very best. He was travelled to away games in Europe every time, he was always in the stands supporting us. He'd be up at the training ground watching training. No, he took a, a big big part in the club for a number of years. Um, obviously his father was still alive when we won the title. And we had a wonderful party in the Café de Paris, him and his father was there, so great memories. But it's changed days now, unfortunately, at Monaco. He's taken, a, he's taken a bit of a back. He's still at the games, mm -hmm. but um, the new Russian majority shareholders are in now. So. But the Prince wanted you back, didn't he, in 2009? I was very close to going back in 2009, yep. At um, his bidding? How did you know that? He told me. All oh, right, it's interesting. Yeah, long story short, I, was, I went to Charlotte. No, 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 no. This is the place for long stories. All oh, right, OK. <laughs> Here we go. People often say, well, why did you go to Charlois? So I went to Charlois in Belgium uh, in, in December. Um, and really, it was to test, see if I could coach in French, work uh -huh. on my French. Uh -huh. um, they were sitting in a relegation battle, so I went across, had a look, and I thought, why not? A challenge, I'll sign a contract to the end of the season uh, and see how I get on. Took my assistant, Tommy Craig. So we went in uh, after, it was close season, well, the, the winter break, so we had a training camp in Turkey, um, assessed the squad um, and felt we needed a couple of players. Managed to get, a, I thought, a v two good players and a young centre-half from Monaco for 75,000 euros. And a midfielder called um, Adeline Ghidorah mm -hmm. um, from Courtrai on a free transfer. Um, and both of them did a great job for the team. <coughs> Cut a long story short, we started, this, started well and we finished and we pulled away from relegation zone. Um, but Job done. Job done, job but done. After, after, just before the transfer window closed, um, went to training, there was a Brazilian um, central defender on the training pitch. A lot of trialists came and went. That was the way the club was. I have no problem with that. I actually enjoy trialists coming to the training pitch mm -hmm. to have a look at them. Mm -hmm. Came in after training, sat down with the staff because I kept a lot of the French staff and says, uh, how long is the Belgian here for on, on trial? And they all looked at me and says, he's signed. The president signed him. Mm -hmm. So I was three, mm -hmm. three weeks in the job and the president had signed a player. So. Mm. I had a choice to make. I'd left Hibs after not a long time, 14 months in the job. What do I do here? Three weeks into the job. Um, do I go home or do I see it through to the end of the season? So I made my mind up. I'll see it through to the end of the season. But at the end of the season, I won't be staying. It's not my, that's not the rules that I work by. If I'm the manager, then I've got to make decisions on who comes and who goes. Um, certainly got to be a discussion hard before we sign a player. But the, the, the Brazilian was a good kid, but he never played for me. Um, so, towards the end of that, a month before the end of the season, I got a phone call from Monaco. Uh, would you come and talk? Uh, one of the directors would like you to come and talk to us um, about maybe taking over at the end of the, start, end of the season, the start of the next season. So we played Standard Liège on the Saturday night, um, that, which was a big derby for Charlois and beat them. So Sunday morning I got the flight from Brussels to, to Nice, uh, went to meet the president, uh, one of the, the directors. Um, and Prince Albert was there um, and we spoke about would I be interested in taking the job and I said yep, I'd definitely be interested um, obviously my contract finishes in four weeks time uh, so we shoot and says okay that's great we'll look forward to taking the discussions forward we never talked money um, unfortunately I went back to Monaco they hired a director of football, French Mark Keller, Mark Keller right. director of football and he wanted a French manager um, which at the time was bitterly disappointing for me. I'd shook, shook with the, the president and the, one of the directors. Um, and I lost out on the job. Um, and Monaco 
the, the manager they took on ended up it a disaster. Work. They didn't got work. relegated. Didn't work. Yeah. Um, they ended up getting relegated. But my opportunity kind of went and it kind of sickened me for a while. I left Shawa and I, after I thinking I was getting the Monaco job, mm. I had other offers, but not quite the, the same quality team as Monaco. And I, and, I, and I never went back in for a while. Mm. Um, Football does that to people often. I think yeah. it can be a... It can be a treacherous sport. Yeah, it can, but again, that's I think there's probably lots of managers and coaches out there who have been in similar situations. They've talked to clubs and think it's nearly done, nearly over the line, and it happens, so happens that it doesn't get done or get concluded. Um, but it was close. Um, Damn shame. And it was exciting times, but oh it never my. happened. That's oh life. God. Well, listen, maybe learn your Russian, speak to the owner, let's see, <laughs> maybe get this back on. How far was your house, or how far... Were you from a younger man, maybe a couple of years, Gregor Townsend? Gregor was from my hometown, Aye. yep. Gala Shields, he went, he was like the same year as my brother. Um, maybe one or two years younger than me. Um, but again, growing up, um, I was kind of doing well on the football side in the, in the town and Gregor was the one that everybody was talking about, is the up and coming rugby player. Um, and I played rugby at school, first and second year. Um, so when I watch rugby, I've got enough idea what a, what's happening in a game, who's a good player. But when I watched him as a, as a young, even all through his career, Gregor was a fantastic rugby player, intelligent, skillful, strong. Um, and he went down the same route as me. He went to France and learned um, probably a lot over in France in preparation. Um, and he's turned out to be a fantastic coach. The job he's done at Glasgow is incredible. And uh, He's the player that would draw you to the game because he would take risks and do clever things, intelligent things that other people couldn't I've, see. I've got a really interesting... Last season, we had the Leinster, the Irish rugby team, were mm -hmm. playing Glasgow and they came up to the training ground um, to watch our training and ask questions. At Lennox then? Uh, yeah. So I said to their coaches, this is... Uh, Tell me, how does uh, Gregor coach and how does his team's play? He's probably the best description, biggest compliment I can give him. They play rugby like Barcelona play football. <laughs> and I thought, wow, mm. if that is not the biggest and best compliment that you could be handed to a young Scottish rugby coach, I thought, wow. But pardon me, I was surprised that they say that quite so, such a great coach, but I'm so happy for Gregor. But, tells you what he's done and, and the mark he's made in his sport because people think of rugby being all about power, strength, but mm -hmm. Gregor's brought movement, mm -hmm. intelligence, people playing with their heart, their brain, their legs together. Mm. Um, so it's nice to hear him. As a player, he, he was an Iniesta rugby player, I think, in terms of the flow, the movement, the, the, the spaces that he saw, right. ideas that he had. Again, it's just like a central midfield player. Your head's constantly moving right, left, scanning your shoulder. What I call, I use the word scanning when I'm teaching players. Top players scan constantly. Their head's looking right, left, all the time. Um, and that's what Gregor was. He's constantly looking for opportunities. Mm. Where do I pass it? <laughs> where do I burst? Where do I sprint through? Where's the gaps? And um, from that point of view, there's similarities. So did Scotland miss a great out half, a great, a great no, scrum? I was, I was always better at football or rugby. I was okay at the rugby, but uh, football was always my, my main sport. What is it about the, pay, the, the, the place that you two grew up in that, that conditioned both of you to be so competitive, so hungry to learn, um, so European, both of you? Uh, What's Borders life? Uh, well, Borders life, uh, in those days, when I was down there, it was, there wasn't a lot lot else to do except sport. Sport was a big part at school, uh, after school. We never had Sky Television, we never had 50 channels, we never had PlayStation, Game Boys, Xboxes. We had the scheme, friends, a ball, bits of grass, and that was enough to spend all our time developing our talents and playing a game that we loved. He was playing rugby, I was playing football. Um, and I'm sure his story is the same. He played with bigger, stronger, better players, and he was constantly trying to get better and listening. Listening is a great listening and watching. How do you get better? So was there a tougher mentality down there? I don't know if there was a tougher mentality. I think that's a cliche. I think that's a cliche. I mean, it's tough life in the city centre in Glasgow in the cities, um, but it was a, it's, a, it's a lovely little town in the Gala Shields. In those days, it was mainly a rugby town, but. 
in recent years the football's probably caught up. There's as many, if not more, kids playing football in Gala Shields now than rugby. Um, which is which is nice from the football point of view. Now I, I wouldn't be allowed home uh, by Mrs H if I didn't ask you why why did you wink at the camera? And so everybody asked me that question and I'll tell you the story. Sorry. Um, my daughters, my wife was at the game, my father was at the game, my two girls, young little two and four year olds, were with Granny um, and I promised them watch Dad in the telly <laughs> and I'll give you a nice big wink on the television, so that's who the wink was for, but the did, two girls. But did you have any idea about what might be happening in the sort of football female population of what seems like the fucking world? No, uh, at the, the next day and everybody was saying, well, who are you winking to, what were you winking for? Looked like you were showing off and trying to be cool. That's but, not what people say to me. Uh, I, I, my mum, mum, <laughs> who's 79, Oh, he's so good looking. Uh, it's John Collins' sex trust, symbol. Trust me, it wasn't to the ladies, it was to my two little princesses <laughs> who were sitting with her granny. Uh, lucky, 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 lucky girls. Was, was Scotland a good adventure for you? It's, I, I think it must be, there must be some regrets because you were part of our last good group and maybe a qualification from a group stage was, was within our grasp. Yeah. No? Yeah, I think 98, we were, we were disappointed not to qualify we, when, we, when the group was drawn. Uh, Morocco, Norway and Brazil, we felt we could get that second place mm. um, and I still think we should have, I think we had, the, we had the players to get it. What went wrong? I think again, Norway we should have won, we were the better team against Norway, 1-1. One, one. Um, Brazil, we were never expected to beat them but we put up a great show. And there was nothing left and in the game. And there was not a lot in it, um, we gave a really good account of ourselves. In the last game, we had to go for it. Morocco, we needed a win in the last game. Did the red card condition things a bit? <sighs> what time was it? You tell me. I'd say it was at 1-0, I think. Yeah. I, you know, I, I haven't looked back in the game. I'm not one for looking back and really? analysing defeats and, and bad moments. Probably, probably should have, and you'll probably learn from your, your defeats more than you do from your victories. Um, but my recollection of the game was we were pushing. They scored a the goal. We were pushing, pushing for an equaliser. They counter-attacked it as again. And again, 2-0, we had to go for it. And again, they broke. Um, but there was regrets. We never qualified. Bitter disappointment. Um, but when you look back now, it, we'd love to be in that position now, wouldn't we? Getting to tournaments and being part of the main event, the Tartan Army. Um, no matter what anybody says, the Tartan Army bright up, brighten up the World Cups. And there's a big champions. smile on your face now as you say it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's true, isn't true it? because my, my greatest memory of Scotland is going to the Stade de France, sitting on the bus from the hotel to the stadium. Drive, it was a long way and just seeing Scotland fans at the side of the roads all the way nearly, scarves, and then you get closer to the stadium and it just the numbers build up and the yellow strip, the Brazilians singing and dancing with the Scottish fans, bagpipes. I think, wow, I mean, hmm. it was it was memorable. And then going, obviously, to the stadium and lining up before the game, playing against the mighty Brazil, Ronaldo, and who else was there? Rivaldo, hmm. Roberto Carlos, Cafu. Beto. So there was a lot of quality in that team. But, you know, we were organised, we were disciplined under Craig, hmm. uh, and we were hard to beat. Hmm. Um, but we never played with fear. And I think that was one of the things. We just went. We, we, we had a go. Look, character in your group, I think. Yeah, I think when you look back now with Tom Boyd and Burley, Henry, um, myself and Lambo, middle of the park, we were comfortable on the ball. Um, Darren Jackson played. Gordon, was Gordon Jury playing? We'd have been about that at the time. Uh, we, we, had, we had good legs at the top of the pitch as well. Mm. I mean, Kevin Gallagher, sharp, chased everything. So we gave it everything. Um, and it'd be nice if in the future we get back. This, this passion for the Tartan Army and for a style of football, it would, I don't know what you're... I mean, I guess one of your objectives would be a Monaco-style situation where a club that you like and trust, a club with a character that wants to play football that says, yes, we, we like, and an owner that believes in you. I guess that's one of your maybe of career goals. But... At some stage in the future, Scotland manager? Does that fulfil you? Or? I think the Scotland manager at this moment in time is a tough job. Um, would it 
Yeah, I, I don't think you ask any Scottish ex-player, a Scottish person, would you turn down the national job? I don't think you would ever turn it down. But at this moment in time, it's not something that uh, I'm thinking about. No, no, no. I, I, it's, no, OK, I'm not, certainly not talking about now or, or Gordon's position at all. Just like while you were talking, this isn't a visual medium. Yeah. There was a big, there was a big grin, a big sort of happy yeah. well, grin coming your face. Well, it was a happy period in my life being part of the national squad. I mean, I went in Italia 90. That was my first um, event. I was in the squad. I never made the start in 11 or the bench, but um, it actually frustrated me being, being there. Mm. But it stoked the fire. I wanted to get in that team and, and get back to a World Cup. So um, being part of it, um, international matches, packed Hamden's, getting to finals, getting to European Champions. It was, a, I mean, it's a pinnacle for any, any player. The pinnacle is standing in that <coughs> middle of that turf at Hamden, facing the main stand, your father, your mother, your friends in there watching it, uh, the national anthem blasting out. It doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any higher than that. No matter what anybody says, Nothing beats that feeling. You're picked for your country. Number one, all the football players, you're representing your country. It's a great feeling. Um, certainly was for me. Um, and I had it for about maybe a 10 year period, near enough, which is a long time. And um, at the time, obviously, media and fans expected, wanted more of us when we got to the finals. But when you look back now, we did not too bad. Um, There's no question about that whatsoever. Listen, it's possibly, uh, before we finish, we started the last Westillian Petrov and golf. Let's maybe finish yours and how, how's, how's your golf? Golf's, uh, the handicap should be better, 11.9, but I'm playing to about eight or nine just now. I'm really enjoying it. I enjoy the golf. I live uh, on a golf course over here in East Lothian, beautiful part of Scotland. A little bit cooler just now for the golf, <laughs> but... Uh, it's a sport I enjoy, it's, a, it's competitive um, and I've got lots of good friends here I play with and have challenges. What's your favourite club? When you reach for the bag, what are you happiest pulling out of that bag? Uh, mm, a 60 degree loft wedge at the moment. Just putting it in just the Just chipping it in, and just getting it, chipping just over the bunkers, 60, 50 yard chips. Enjoying that just now. If you'd asked me that two years ago, it was the worst club in my bag. But <laughs> I've worked a little bit the last no, year or so. There's a way to finish. There's a John Collins theme. That, listen, for people who... This, we will stop on this. What's your advice? Because you, you've... Dave Brailsford and Cycling always talks about marginal gains. Yeah. The intensity of your desire to better yourself and to show others <laughs> that they can do it too. That's a defining trait of every conversation I've ever yes. had with you. What, 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 how do you encapsulate that for somebody who's listening to this now and thinking I don't know if I can do it I don't know if I can achieve it I don't know if I've got enough what do you what do you explain from your experience about how to improve yourself succeed well my experience I always go back to when I was 15 I went up to Dundee United on a trial with a great manager Jim McLean and they were the, probably the best team for developing young players at that time so I went up on trial um, and I was still playing for Hutchison Vale in Edinburgh at the time. Three of my teammates had signed to go full time there, so I was hoping to be the fourth. So I went in the week's trial, and the feedback was, no, you not quite got it. Um, we'll keep an eye on you. Um, so in those days, there was no mobile phones, mm. so I was driving home, I'm driving home, getting the bus home from Dundee to Gala Shields. A long, lonely journey home. And going back to school the next day to tell my buddies that I'll be staying on at school, I've been knocked back. Uh, but on that journey home I thought, I'm going to prove them wrong. They said I was too small, maybe a little bit weak. So that was in November. Um, middle of December I got a phone call from Hibbs to come in on a trial, Pat Stanton at Hibbs. I had a week's training and it was with the first team. Um, and I think I did well. I was just nine, nine stone, little kid for gala, up training with the and at the end of the week, um, Pat came in and says, phone your dad, I'd like your dad to come up tomorrow and have a chat. My dad came up and Pat Stanton says to my dad, we're going to offer him a two-year apprenticeship and I can promise you, Mr Collins, age means nothing to me. When John's good enough, ready, he'll be in the team. And I signed, I left school in January just before my, 15th, my 16th birthday. 31st of January is my birthday. So I went full-time. Um, started getting the bus up for Gala Shields 
at seven o'clock in the morning, um, getting home at seven at night, and running from St Andrews bus station down Easter Road, back up to get the bus home. And I continued playing for my boys club for the six months. I played for the reserves on the Wednesday night, trained every day like a beast. I was in the gym <laughs> trying to build my, six, my nine stone frame up. So season finished, never forget, my dad says, you don't stop training. You're going back pre-season to be fittest at that training ground. So I trained all close season, came back for pre-season. All the first team boys are telling me, hey, slow down, stay in the group, who you try to feel. And then my dad says, don't ever stick with the group. Push away from them. Don't be happy with their standards, stay at your own. Washing the stands, Friday night, first pre-season friendly match of the season, Manchester City against Hibs. I'm cleaning the seats with Paul Kane, Mickey Weir up the stand because they've been all dusty throughout the summer. Wiping the seats down. Shout for Pat Stout with cigar. Hey, come down to my office. And the manager, I'd just been at the club for six months, playing my boys club. He's took me into his office, he's smoking his cigar. He says, is your dad coming to the game tonight? I says, no, my dad only comes to watch me and he's a Celtic supporter. He says, oh, is that right, son? Looked at me with kind of a little smile on his face. He says, you better phone him and tell him to come because you're going to play the night. And I left, left his office, went back up to clean the seats and the boys, I thought he was joking. The boy says, what did the manager say? He says, he says I'm playing the night. I'm like, eh? I said, I don't know if he was joking. I went back down and asked him. And he says, <laughs> you're playing tonight, phone your dad. See, seriously, not, Mr. Stanton, is it true? Am I'm I a, genuine? I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and sure enough, it was true to his word, a manager, Nothing to do with age, trained well, and seen something in me, put me in the team. That was Friday night. Did fairly well, wide left. Played Jackie McNamara's testimonial on the Sunday, two days later against Newcastle United. Um, Beardsley and all them, and George Best was guesting for Hibs. So, my second game, who am I sitting next to? In the dressing room getting changed, the legend George Best. He's playing inside left, I'm playing outside left getting passes from him, playing one-twos, and I'm like, wow. It was like a dream come true, but I wasn't ready for the first team. I was just a little, tiny little lad, but Pat Stanton was a smart guy. That whole se the season started, I never played in the first team. I went back to the reserves, and the following season, I was in the first team debut at Aberdeen, but Todry, and we lost a few late goals, unlucky. But, a manager, again, that's when I'm a manager, I love giving young players an opportunity because for the grace of God, it might never, I might not have had the career I had if it wasn't for a brave manager saying, you know what, because all the first team boys wanted to play against Manchester City. People yeah. think it's just a friendly, but the first game of the season, everybody, all the first team players want, and there's this little kid, Harley, had a training session with the first team in the first team. So, Pat's done, I owe him so much on Hibs, of course. Of course, because that was my first club. But he fed me that little bit and that drove me on. But it all came maybe from Jim McLean knocking me back. And it's a great story to tell lots of, because young players get knockbacks. Life's about knockbacks all the time. Barriers all around you. Mm. You come to a barrier, what do you do? Somebody says you're not good enough, you say okay. Or do you think, you know what, I'm going to prove him wrong, prove me right. I'm going to go round the barrier, over the bar, I'm going to find a way of doing it. And it's a message I tell all young players. It's not where you start, it's where you go. Whether it's in the gym or out in shooting practice, how many you score at shooting with your right foot, left foot, how many free kicks you can put in the top corner, bottom corner. Your numbers are important, and you've got to set yourself st targets. Never be happy where you are. Always try and get better and push yourself, push yourself. And that's what I did. I did for 19 years. Um, I was fortunate. Um, I had coaches that gave me a chance. Um, I worked my socks off. I had very few injuries, which is a, is, I mean, a lot has got to do with good luck, good fortune, but also good preparation. I turned up for training, having a good night's sleep and being ready and alert on the training pitch. So I never got any, picked up many injuries in the training pitch. Um, and it's all about preparation. Putting the work in on the training pitch, and people talk about having the will to win. The will to win in a match, the kicks off, is important. It's very important. But what is absolutely vital is the training. What you do is vital. If you don't do the proper training during the week, 
you don't get the performance on the Saturday. So that's what we've got to get into players' mind. Because in Scotland, I see the game's kicked off and everybody's running about, giving 100%, running, chasing. But they've got to do that training Monday to Friday, morning, afternoon, how they're sleeping, eating. We've got to get that into the mindset. How can we get better at every single aspect? You talked about the cycling. Mm. It's true. How do they get better with the right foot, left foot, control, speed, endurance, stronger, core, direct free kicks. It's about details and about pushing, 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 pushing the boundary. Um, but it all comes back down to, again, is quality coaching. Co players don't grow on trees, they're developed. They're developed with good coaches and good habits on the training pitch. That's my the, belief. Then the, the, the sooner that that knowledge, that passion, that ability to develop is back somewhere, hopefully in Scottish football, um, the better forever is the recipient of uh, your attitude and knowledge. Um, privilege. A pleasure, as expected. Thank you very much. What a great career. My pleasure. The Big Interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear, the music that you love, is Beer Jacket, who's always been there for us. You can keep up with everything that we do by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv. How many times do I have to tell you? Yes, several thousand of you have done it, but come on, slackers at the back, sign up. That grahamhunter.tv site is also where you can buy the new updated version of my book, Barca, The Making of the Greatest Team in the World. It's my account of the Guardiola era at the camp now, from 2008 until 2012, plus Tito, Tata, and Adios Johan Cruyff. It is in all good bookshops now, but it does also make a big difference to all of us who've worked on the project. If you choose to buy direct, particularly for Christmas, at grahamhunter.tv forward slash books. You'll be sure to get the new edition and you will be helping us to continue producing independent content. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon.